When we decided to do this forum series uh, called How Will You Measure Your Life, Brian is one of the first people that came to my mind uh, because if we're going to talk about not just the value of life, but what is the purpose of life, then I, I think that Brian has had a lot of time to really think about that in light of his story. Um, and also, because he's so uh, intimately connected to St. John's, I thought that it would be just a wonderful opportunity to bring him back and, and for us to, A, see the, um, the uh, uh, product of our prayers for him. Uh, and B, just to have a chance to reconnect with him and hear his wonderful voice and see his face. So, Brian, welcome to St. John's again. Wow, thanks so much, Sari. I can hear that. Sounds like everybody can hear. Um, yeah, it's great to be here, um, which, given the circumstances, is probably, you know, we don't need to say that, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, so he's already given some intro. In, in 2014, I was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. The medical community basically offered me no hope. After 55 rounds of chemotherapy, I am here, and this is my story. So, oh yeah, and this is the medical community's opinion. Uh, Get this out of the way, standard disclaimer here. Due to the nature of the forum, I'm gonna to have to condense and oversimplify a lot of information. And I ask that if there's any questions, we'll hold those till later. There will be a little time at the end. We can go into more depth if we want to. So it was a lovely spring day in uh, 2014. My wife, Carol, and I were preparing our garden beds uh, for new spring and summer plantings. We're hauling big bags of manure and soil enhancements and spreading them around. Uh, then uh, after a vigorous day, later I felt a strange pain in my left side. And I thought, well, it's some kind of muscle strain that I, I'd just overdone it. But for days, the pain wouldn't go away and even grew worse. This was no ordinary pulled muscle. Something was wrong. So I saw my regular doctor, he ordered a CT scan, they found a small cyst on my pancreas and also infl inflammation like pancreatitis. So he put me on a clear liquid diet to clear up the pancreatitis and then um, also referred me to a gastroenterologist who then ordered another test, an MRI. Uh, he also ran the first time a uh, blood test, a CA199, pancreatic cancer tumor marker. My number was elevated. Uh, a normal reading is less than 37. Uh, by July, mine was 1,500 and rising rapidly. Uh, I eventually crested at over 4,000, by the way. Uh, there are things other than cancer that can cause elevated numbers, but the doctor said it was super clear. He never saw anything over a thousand that was not cancer. So then off we go to University of Maryland to get an ultrasound, uh, endoscopy, and a biopsy for a complete diagnosis. And of course, after the doctor says this terrible thing to us, um, that bombshell, there's crying and screaming, it's not fair, you know, what are we gonna do? Uh, and then, the day comes, we're at um, University of Maryland, and by the way, I'm still on this clear liquid diet. By this time, I've dropped over 40 pounds. Uh, so if the EUS, they send a scope down your throat, and they look at your, get live pictures of your GI tract and ultrasounds of the stuff that's nearby. They put you under for that, but it's still pretty unpleasant. Uh, the results were not surprising. The GI doctor already prepared us for the worst, but it was still devastating. Uh, diagnosis is carcinoma of the pancreas with metastases to the liver. So in other words, stage four pancreatic cancer. So the prognosis for this is grim and there are few treatment options and none of them are good. Uh, stage four pancreatic cancer has a five-year survival rate of 1%. So what should we do? Pursue treatment? Yeah, obviously. But with such a grim outlook, should 
my wife Carol quit her job so we can maybe squeeze in the most out of the small time we might have left together? Uh, should we go quickly go, go make memories as the nurse at University of Maryland rather unhelpfully and insensitively suggested? Uh, I said, uh, I said no. possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. <laughs> so I said, no, don't tell me the odds. At the outset, we're going to make our decisions as though I'm going to make it through this. And the time passes, and we need to make other decisions according to the best information we have. Then we'll do that at the time. But right now, we fight. Right now, we wage hope. So we spring into action and initiated my now semi-famous cancer action plan. Some of you have seen this. Um, and this action plan consists of the following. Conventional chemotherapy, acupuncture, and Chinese herbal medicine. I take a lot of pills. A healthy anti-cancer diet, gentle exercise, deepen spirituality and personal connections, and lots of green tea. All right, PowerPoint. Oh, don't do that. Okay, so how did this come about? Um, I got a referral to a great acupuncturist who specializes in cancer uh, patients. Um, we did a lot of online research. None of it was really encouraging, but it was helpful nonetheless. And I got a couple helpful books from uh, my uh, uh, sister and from my brother-in-law. Uh, first, we Radical Remission. This author is a PhD in integrative oncology. She looks at those odd cases, the, one, the outliers who have uh, unexplained spontaneous healings or what they call radical remissions and so she looks what characteristics do those people share and are there medical non-medical things people can do to help better their outcomes uh, similarly um, the book anti-cancer leaned really heavily on this one it's part memoir and part action plan the author actually was diagnosed with this really serious hard to operate poor prognosis uh, brain tumor uh, so he set out to discover self-treatment options, how he could improve his survival chances and decrease his odds of recurrence, or for others, decrease the chance that he actually get cancer in the first place. So lots of good, lots of good practical tips and uh, amazing case studies uh, were involved in that and that helped me form my, uh, my plan for action. Now we all have cancer cells in our bodies but not everyone will develop cancer. I know that sounds scary, right? So cancer formation is related to inflammation. It's kind of like a wound that won't heal. Our cells constantly reduplicate, and, but they also live uh, and die in a programmed uh, cycle. Uh, and that cycle is called apoptosis. Now sometimes something goes wrong with the copy of the cells and that's okay, because our immune system can take care of it. We have natural killer cells. They go destroy these mutant cells, just like they would, say, a virus or a bacteria or something that doesn't belong. But sometimes the immune system doesn't catch the problem. So that's when those mutant cells turn evil. Uh, they duplicate, and they don't, uh, but they don't die according to the regular pattern. And they form a protective cloak around themselves so the immune system can't find them anymore. Uh, and then in the process called angiogenesis, they appropriate new blood cell uh, uh, sources, uh, vessels, to feed themselves and drain resources from the surrounding tissues. Now, at that point, we have full-blown cancer tumors. So how does this happen? Briefly, uh, some of the factors that encourage this type of inflammation are the typical American diet, uh, refined sugars, red meats, processed meats, um, 
by the way, uh, the World Health Organization a couple years ago declared that processed meats, say like hot dogs, to be a similar cancer risk category as smoking. Uh, so unhealthy fats and oils, factory farmed uh, eggs and dairy, uh, persistent anger and despair, sedentary lifestyle, environmental toxins, uh, cigarette smoking, and we'll come back to this a little bit when we talk about the, the diet part of the plan uh, later. So first leg that we saw in the little, the little video is uh, conventional Western oncology. Basically, chemotherapy was the only option for me uh, because I was at a stage four. Um, and the first line treatment for my particular cancer is called Fulfarinox. It's kind of an A-bomb of uh, chemotherapy. It's got four different agents. You administer it by IV. I sat down in a big naugahyde reclining chair in the cancer center for five hour long infusion uh, every two weeks. And then I would stumble home completely exhausted and nauseated. And then I got to have a 48 hour long uh, slow drip chemo with a little man purse I would carry around with me at home. Um, so stuff is super toxic, lots of side effects. You lose sensation in your fingers, there's nausea lots of fatigue, hair loss, which you can't tell now, but uh, GI upset, cold sensitivity, you know, you reach into the freezer and it feels like a porcupine just shot your hand full of quills. So that was that, that's nasty stuff. Uh, hateful, as our, our friend said. Uh, the other part's traditional Chinese medicine, which includes acupuncture and herbs. It's a 3,000 plus year old medical system it's kind of based on the idea that there's a chi or energy that flows through the body in normal, healthy, living beings. Now, traditional Chinese medicine seems to keep that chi flowing freely and properly and keeps your body balanced. So if you have energy trapped in this system, that means that's called disease. And if things are flowing properly, that's wellness. So our aim here is to encourage the body's own self-healing abilities. And we use acupuncture, all those little needles, and uh, some herbal teas. Um, and I used this in particular to offset and minimize the side effects of chemotherapy, which were awful, and perhaps even to try to slow and reverse the growth of the cancer itself. So if you're interested in acupuncture, look for someone who's certified by the National Certification Commission for acupuncture and oriental medicine. Um, just make sure you, you know, you got somebody that really knows what they're doing. So the next thing is the anti-cancer diet part. Uh, and right from the beginning, and somehow we forgot this in, in Western medicine, but right from the beginning, Hippocrates equates food with medicine. So here's a little summary of some of my guidelines. Uh, we want to reduce the inflammation and try to inhibit cancer growth through uh, diet as well as the other, the medical angle. So again, sugar is our kind of our number one enemy here. We want to avoid the refined grains, and the simple carbs, sugar, especially added sugars, processed foods. We talked about how who thinks hot dogs and uh, Cigarettes are similar. Uh, jams, jellies, because they're packed and cooked in sugars. Uh, processed meats, red. Sweetened drinks, soda is one of the worst things you could ever do. Uh, it's also like really bad for your liver and all kinds of things. So instead of all that stuff, prefer assorted whole grains and complex carbohydrates so your body can absorb the sugars more slowly. Uh, eat real whole foods, what I call food as God made it. Uh, including natural whole fruit. Uh, some fruits that are especially good are these uh, blueberries, cherries, raspberries, uh, stone fruits. So those delicious peaches that are going to be around the stores before too long again. Uh, those are all great for you. Lots of vegetables and lean proteins like uh, fish, uh, lean poultry, nuts, and cruciferous vegetables. You lean heavily on the things like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, 
Uh, fortunately, I love all that stuff, so that's great, you know? And also, instead of soda, you know, try clean, filtered water. Green tea is awesome. And I've been a teetotaler through this whole thing. But uh, my sources also say if you limit yourself one glass red wine, no more than one glass per day, red wine, as long as it's eaten with a meal, it's OK, too. Now, I also have some nutritional supplements. And uh, this is what I call my, my Tic Tac supplements. Uh, and you see it's kind of an acronym. Uh, first of all is turmeric, which you know from Indian food and curry. Uh, it has been clinically shown to be a powerful anti-inflammatory agent and an anti-cancer agent. And even the conservative MD Anderson Cancer Center has been studying uh, turmeric as an anti-cancer uh, agent. So it inhibits angiogenesis, so it keeps cancer cells from getting those new blood vessels, and also uh, kind of forces those cancer cells to die again according to the regular schedule that they're supposed to. Uh, green tea, also super antioxidant, destroying free radicals, helps your body eliminate toxins, also has direct anti-cancer properties, uh, like turmeric, it helps uh, prevent angiogenesis and it can slow growth of some uh, kinds of cancers. And aloe is a, an immune, has been shown to be an immune booster, not rubbing it on, eating it. Uh, uh, vitamin C is a super powerful antioxidant and actually maybe later it, we can talk more specifically about this. but. Uh, it, uh, it protects your healthy cells, but at the same time, it can be selectively, through a weird mechanism, it can be selectively toxic to cancer cells, actually. So that's a lot, but here it is in, in brief. Eat real whole foods. Eat food as God made it. Maximize your fruits and veggies. Eat good quality lean proteins. Avoid all those simple sugars, added sugars, what I call white foods. Um, avoid processed foods, and have the Tic Tac supplements. Tic Tac. Turmeric, tea, aloe, and C. Tic Tac. OK, so this brings us, you know, this is a church group, right? And so we've got to talk about this. And really, for my own story, we really have to talk about this because it's this super important to me personally, not just because we're here at this particular place. Um, so this is the, uh, the next part of the action plan. So building, strengthening connections with other people, maintaining a positive mental outlook, and practicing prayer and meditation. So building and strengthening connections, it's super easy to feel isolated when facing a scary and difficult disease. No one else around you knows what you're going through. People don't know what to say, so they either shrink away or they say dumb but well-meaning things to try to cheer you up. Um, so, but still, find someone to connect with, someone who will let you complain as much as you need to, and someone who's willing to distract you and when you just really need a break, because I can't think about this right now, OK? So, and if you're the well person and you know someone who's sick, then be that person. Be the person who can sit there and just listen to the complaints or do something goofy to distract the person if that's what they need to. So when I first got sick, um, the support of the outpouring of support was just uh, incredible. I got cards and letters, well wishes, and I just never knew what the power of a sympathy card was. You know, to me, before I got sick, I thought, well, this is, you know, maybe somebody has something X wrong happen, bad happen, you know, and I should send a sympathy card or something. I said, well, this is stupid. What is a card going to do? But no, it really means a lot. It is just so, so touching and deeply meaningful. So everybody, you know, like, thank you. This community was very supportive. Uh, I was also able to connect with some old college friends and even uh, from high school. And my family was super awesome. My wife, Carol, she was my biggest booster, cheerleader, and just a super all-around great teammate through this. My mom and dad were around a lot. 
They traveled to and from their home in Tennessee, and they provided chemo appointment transportation. You know, they're not as young as they used to be. And they have their own health problems, but they were there too, because that's what parents do. And uh, my sister was super supportive. Um, we've been corresponding a lot more lately since this all happened. So that's a, actually a good side effect. So, and so then family and friends have been a huge part of me being able to cope with all of this mess. Maintaining a positive outlook, which is super hard to do when everyone around you is telling you you're gonna die and you're suffering through these treatments that make you feel like some dog that's just been kicked in the head. So how do you do this? Well, one thing was very easy. <laughs> And it's super easy to do, uh, and uh, we enacted a strict news fast when this thing started. We controlled and dra drastically reduced our news intake, especially from the electronic and new media. That stuff is designed to make you anxious, and it, it becomes addictive, and it's damaging. Real studies show people who lessen their news intake are happier. So seriously, if you're facing a major illness, you have enough problems already, Turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. Kill the television. <laughs> also, wow, that color did not come out right. Um, <laughs> find joy in each day. Be sure to notice those little things and take advantage of life's simple pleasures as much as you can. Uh, the bad's often right up in front of your face. Um, super plain to see. Uh, but try to focus on the good. Uh, as uh, St. Paul said, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So set aside also some time for yourself in the spiritual realm to have a peaceful, quiet time alone each day. Uh, whether first thing in the morning or late at night, whatever works for you. Clear, and in meditation, you can clear your mind of distractions and worries. Breathe slowly and deeply. Focus on your breath. Inhale, exhale. Concentrate each breath as it comes in and out. Now, I practice Qigong, uh, which combines deep breathing with some coordinated simple movements. So it's kind of like part exercise and part meditation. And this is a phrase we say in the Eucharistic liturgy in the Eastern churches um, you know, every, every time we have a Eucharistic liturgy. Let us now lay aside all earthly care that we may receive the king of all. And that's partly what I strive to do in meditation, which also dovetails us into prayer. Now, prayer then becomes a chance to focus on something and someone else that's bigger than all of my problems. There are a lot of things that are out of our control, um, and part of prayer is letting go of trying to control everything. I, one of the lessons here is relinquish control. It's actually liberating. You know, there is a God, you are not God. And that takes a lot of the pressure off. Again, when I go back uh, to the scripture, can any of us, be, by worrying, add a single hour to our lives? Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I say amen to that last phrase. Cast your anxiety on him, on God, because he cares for you. And when we pray, it's totally okay to complain. It's totally okay to be honest, to say, God, I hurt, I'm scared, this isn't fair, whatever. Just let her rip, because God can take it. And here's a little odd thing, that praying for yourself and for others sometimes helps you transcend your own suffering. Somehow by looking beyond your own suffering and extending your concern, even while you're suffering, toward others, it can help you give, a, give you a sense of peace, 
even if it's only transitory. Again, as St. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So back to the uh, narrative here. I continued to slog on through my really harsh bi-weekly full Farinox chemotherapy. Uh, throughout the whole treatment, my white blood cells, my platelets dropped, dropped, dropped. Um, liver function, tanking. Finally, by uh, June 2016, I had to stop chemotherapy after 42 rounds due to low liver function and low platelet counts. I was still feeling relatively good, you know, given the circumstances, uh, and was posting good, stable, low tumor markers. My tumor marker peaked up there at 4,000, over 4,000. I came down into the 40s, and it was just, just bobbing right along at that level. And then he said, well, we have to discontinue because you're too weak now. So that was scary. They also then put me on a very low kind of sub-therapeutic dose of one of the agents. Uh, basically, it probably wasn't doing anything, but it's like it was really hard to pull the plug completely. Uh, but all the while, I was continuing my uh, traditional Chinese medicine. I was continuing up with uh, acupuncture and the, the herbal medicines. So then after nine months with only traditional Chinese medicine, and that minuscule amount of chemotherapy, uh, my condition still remained stable. Then, much to my surprise, my oncologist asked if I wanted to take a chemo break. So after almost three years of chemo, 55 rounds of various kinds, yeah, I was super enthusiastic to do it, you bet. So now, since the spring of 2017, I've been on a monitored break, and my tumor marker has, and my uh, images have remained stable. And those other blood counts, the liver function, uh, they're slowly rebounding. The body is starting to heal itself. Now, this is not what anyone would call remission, but there, it is at this point, but it is a very significant milestone. We always have to keep in mind, if the cancer does indeed fire up again, we'll have to jump into some other kind of treatment. Um, but my situation right now, if you know anything about pancreatic cancer, you know it's super unusual. And even my oncologist called it near miraculous. You know, if you're an oncologist, you can't say just miraculous. It has to be near miraculous, right? Okay. So we took advantage of the good news and took advantage of the chemo break, and we decided, Carol and I, to celebrate by taking in the Grand Canyon uh, in early September this year, which I never would have thought I'd walk down the Bright Angel Trail in Grand Canyon uh, three years ago. Not even close. So the cancer journey thing really has been more than a nightmare. Uh, starting with that strangely intense pain, the first scan that was, uh-oh, and more tests confirming the worst case uh, diagnosis and all that that could possibly mean was just indescribable devastation. Is it in that moment, or the series of moments, really, everything changed a confident future suddenly become, became, wow, this could be it. But even in the face of those bleak statistics and the bleak prognosis, I resolved to approach my treatments and plans as though I would indeed beat the odds and survive. And I believe that approach has served us all well. Instead of hurriedly rushing off to make some memories, as the unhelpful nurse uh, suggested, we plunged headlong into various activities to promote healing and promote recovery. Even the recent trip to Grand Canyon during the chemo break 
was a celebration and not just some hasty bucket list thing. So super shocking, the treatments were grueling, but my abiding faith continues to be, was and continues to be a huge factor in helping me to cope, to endure, and to persevere through all of the hard stuff. And there was a lot of hard stuff. So when confronted with this disaster, strangely, I felt closer to God rather than abandoned. And of course, that doesn't make any sense when your logical self thinks about it. And I have trouble expressing this, this idea adequately. It's totally natural and even justifiable in this situation to say, God, where are you? But instead, oddly, I found myself saying, oh, there you are. And this is no boasting on my part, for sure, because a gigantic dose of humility and humiliation are among those so-called gifts that cancer gives you. I know well I am still, as Paul said, the chief among sinners, but God has shown me great mercy and given me peace in the storm in these last uh, three-plus years. During the journey, the phrase, give us this day our daily bread, gained totally new meaning for me. Throughout the struggle, the burden of treatment was nearly overwhelming. Sometimes all I could do on any given day was just drag myself out of bed and do that, that one thing that was required of me that one day, or sometimes that one hour. Even contemplating anything more than that was just too much. Indeed, as the saying goes, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. But as it turned out, sufficient also was the grace. So even now, while things are going well, and I do look forward to the future and hope, some measure of that day-by-day -day approach persists. Focus intently on the day at hand, celebrate life's little victories with thanksgiving. So in conclusion, as a doxology, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think, according to the power at work in us, to him be glory in the church, in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Um, I want to do something different with the questions today. Um, I know we have questions for Brian, and, and I will, I'll, I'll open that up for a few minutes at the end. I want to ask you first, how did this message, Brian's words, how did it have an effect on you? Uh, how did it change you? How did it inform you? Um, what, what are you taking away with you? Maybe if you feel comfortable even sharing um, something about your own circumstances that this might have spoken specifically to. It doesn't have to be necessarily cancer. It could be about other things. So just take a few minutes first to respond to that question, and then um, um, we will um, open it up maybe for more questions specifically to Brian. Brian, thank you so much for, for sharing today. And as uh, many of you in the audience know, um, having had HIV myself for 25 years, it's, there's everything that you said just resonated yeah. with me. And <clears throat> particularly the idea of we're not God. And it is very freeing and was such a good reminder of how freeing it is to give our problems to God. And, and to look to God and not try to take those problems back from God. Um, that, and then the other thing 
that I, I'm so glad that you were here to be able to share is how important these communities are. And it really, for me, and I think I'm speaking for Joe as well, is really why we wanted to have our series this um, this winter and spring focus on more intimate stories because we it, it's so important to me that this become and is a community where we can feel safe to share these kinds of concerns and stories because through that sharing we we build that community and we never know who we may be able to help um, in, in those situations. I love that turn of phrase, the uh, giving your problems to God and not taking them back. <laughs> Beautiful. I love that. I'm going to have to incorporate that. <laughs> Brian, again, thank you. Um, for me, Betsy and I were talking about this yesterday. For me, um, it's I spend a lot of time intellectualizing God. I spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, sort of an intellectual aspect of God and religion. Um, and this was a great reminder of sort of the soulfulness of God, the heartfeltness of God versus the intellectualness. Um, and so for me, I think this was fan, it was just, it was just a reminder to get out of my head and to get into my soul. Thank you. Cool. The idea of um, offering to listen to somebody that's in need, I, I hadn't really thought of that. Um, and I think I would take that away as if somebody's sick. I would say if you need someone to talk, you know, talk to and listen to what your problems are was useful. Thanks, Brian. Um, I was taken by the fact that the very first thing you said about dealing with this is turning off the news. <laughs> and um, it's particularly, it resonated with me um, because of the horrible news that we have received. Yeah. And so I, you know, I am dealing with that with my daughter in how to react yeah. and how to shut off all the negative stories and focus on positive in the context of dealing with this. I mean, yeah. to me, this is a really tough task for all of us and just turning it off and yet living in our and coping with our world. And then the second thing was the, I, um, I have a lot of understanding about the diet and, and food as medicine. I've been doing a lot of reading about that and understand it. So I want to thank you very much for emphasizing that because I think we as a community um, and as a society, we need to really take your message to heart. Other other people, how did this touch your life today? Having been a caregiver for a very long time, um, before Peggy died, I wondered what to do for you. Because we sit here as a congregation, because I'm in this audience now, <laughs> and I wonder, what can I do? And then every time I sent a card or went to visit Carol, I knew I was taking a risk. Would I say the wrong thing? Would I write the wrong thing? And so I think it's really helpful to have, because I'm an action-oriented person, um, right? OK. Uh -huh. So I like, and I would schlep up there and, you know, and, and meet Carol for lunch and send cards. And was it meaningful? Was it helpful? And obviously, that's what I heard. So yeah. for me, sitting in a pew, seeing your name week after week on that prayer list, and I asking, what can I do? What can I do? I now know what to do and do it better next time. <laughs> Thank you. You know, the whole thing about listening, uh, this was a, it started out as a much longer uh, presentation because I got distracted. I started thinking about Job. You know that guy in the Bible had all those troubles? Well, he had some friends. And uh, when the, uh, as uh, Kurt Vonnegut says, um, when the uh, excrement hit the air conditioning for, <laughs> for Job, his friends came to comfort him. And in the book, that was a great thing. 
until they opened their mouths. Because the moment they opened their mouths, they started saying, well, Job, all this stuff is happening to you. If you, weren't, if you hadn't done something wrong, all this bad stuff wouldn't be happening to you. And then, so, you know, and I went on this whole excursus about Job. And so Job is also ultimately about a lot of the themes that I touched on here. But, uh, with, you know, because he complains a lot, and eventually he relinquishes control, and the friends, by God himself, are chastised for uh, not speaking rightly about God, as my friend Job has spoken. Job was the one who's complaining and saying that it was unfair. And God said, Job's right. You friends who are trying to blame the, guy, the victim are wrong. Anyway, so I had a whole longer thing about that, but this was not a two-hour long forum, so. Thank you, Brian. Where else did this message touch your life today? Um, my own cancer uh, experience was not um, quite as, uh, uh, as challenging as yours, but um, a couple of things that you have said sort of resonated with me. One is, from the very beginning, when you start in that process of diagnosis, my doctor said to me, just know this will take a long time. You're feeling this is urgent, and how the hell can this take time? <laughs> and, you know, it just does, you know? So sort of recognize that, and that was very helpful, and you were emphasizing that was important. Um, the second thing was the nutritional piece. Um, I continue, you know, many years later to, you know, really issue sugars and really work at, at diet and exercise. And, um, you know, I just, I, I'm saddened that, that this message is just not out there very much. It's so important. Um, the third thing is community. I, um, I'm a single person, and uh, <clears throat> when I got that diagnosis, I created Team Nancy. I pulled in all my closest friends. Um, I, I gave them a job. <laughs> um, and they were with me through the whole process, and um, you know, I think it brought us closer. Um, that they could help and just be there for me. Uh, my family was also very important, but you know, you really need to reach out for the people who make you feel good. And sometimes people are well-intentioned, but you really don't want them around you. <laughs> so those are some thoughts that, that I had with, with your message, but um, it's quite a challenge. And I think we shouldn't be too afraid of, if we want to you know, be that person, be with somebody who's suffering, you know, so they, they can you know, bounce their troubles off of us and we'll you know, take it or whatever. But, uh, so you can't be too afraid of saying the wrong thing. Because I think a lot of us know that people don't know what to say. And so, you know, it's okay. It's better, it's better to be present for a person and maybe make a mistake than to say, well, I don't know what to do, so I'm not gonna, I won't do anything. Let's open it up. Any questions, thoughts, anything you'd like to Ryan, we heard you sing years and years ago. You have a beautiful singing voice. No, I, I really mean that. And I'm just wondering whether um, being musical and loving music had any role in your recovery. Um, I, it just seems to be such a positive force in people's lives, people who are musical. Wow, that's interesting. You know, because I, I don't think... I think my answer would be not exactly. Um, there wasn't necessarily anything special. I, I, was, I uh, had really loved playing uh, the trumpet. Uh, and uh, many years ago, it was actually pretty good. And so, you know, I have, suddenly have a lot of time off. And there, you know, this is the time that I was going to felt mm, reasonably good, you know, try to work on that and play. But, I had side effects from the, the treatments. My mouth got super dry, so I could not play at all. I, you know, I, I'd do this, you know, put it up in there and you go. <laughs> yeah, 
so. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, just, but even simple things like just uh, kind of chilling out with some kind of favorite musical environment in the background. Of course, that's, that's definitely part of it. Because it also helps you get out of your own head and like focus on something else besides, you know, I feel like I'm about to throw up or, you know, or whatever. Hi, thanks for sharing today. Um, I'm just curious about the positive mental attitude. Did that come mm -hmm. naturally to you? Are you a naturally positive person, or do you have some something, some system for yourself that you developed? Uh, I think probably not natural. I, I maybe lean a, a little more phlegmatic. Yeah. So, so it, it, it's uh, but you know, kind of necessity is the mother of invention. And I don't know, it, there's, this weird, there's this weird thing that happens. I think when, you're, when something really big happens, or, or if you imagine something bad happening to you, you say, oh, I don't know how I would ever deal with that. I would just crawl up into a little ball and, you know. But, but it, it's... It's weird. What I found is that as the, the depth um, kind of like you have a, a, a well of resources you can draw from. And you know, as the suffering gets, gets worse, the, the water level goes down, down, down. But the weird thing that, that I experienced is that the rope that's attached to the bucket also gets longer. So that as the depth of your suffering increases, so also is the, uh, the depth of the ability to suffer. This is a, um, uh, God has no given you no, there's no temptation or trial uh, that has come to you other than that which is common to human beings. Uh, and uh, God will not allow you to be tested beyond what you are able, but will, with the, the test or temptation, provide you a way out, uh, says Paul. And I think that's kind of like my well metaphor. That rope gets longer as the well gets, gets deeper. Can't explain it, but I know that if you put me back four years ago and said, here's what you're going to go through, I said, there's no way I will ever get through that. Uh, but somehow, and the same thing with, uh, with Carol, you know, she um, doesn't like surprises, uh, you know, or doesn't like bad surprises, and, uh, you know, doesn't deal well with uh, things that are really un unplanned and whatnot, but somehow the, the rope attached to her bucket got longer also through this. So I'm going to actually just ask you one last question, Brian, and then we'll close. Uh, what's next for you right now? Um, I know that you're taking it a day at a time, but yeah. uh, are you starting to think a little bit more long term now? And, and what's next for you? Do you have any dreams, any hopes? Well, you know, it's, it's tough because I'm, I'm still not really out of the, uh, the day by day uh, approach. And I'm not sure how far I'll ever get out, outside of that. And I think in terms of uh, like long-term uh, goals or whatever, I think, I think my, appro my approach maybe has evolved. I think, I, I think of terms like a uh, you know, classic question, where do you see yourself in five years? You know? <laughs> I, I think I view that question now in terms of of uh, relationships. So I, I think it's more what are my long-term goals? I think it, it's more what my, sh it's also what my short-term goals are. And it's at uh, uh, strengthening and enjoying the, uh, the close relationships that I have now and uh, m making them closer, enjoying them more. 
uh, in the in the future, rather than you know I'm gonna you know I'm gonna make my first million dollars and shoot a rocket into space you know or something you know it's not you know whatever you know so uh, for me it's all it's all about it's all about relationships and it's still all about right now it's still all about day by day by day it takes a lot of courage to stand up here and share a story like that with us and um, I just want to invite you will you please stand just join me in honoring Brian for his gift today